stuff on YouTube because of our Good morning, everybody. Or I guess, actually, it's not morning when you guys are listening to this. It's evening. Uh, yeah, me and Alan are sitting here on a Saturday morning recording stream for you guys. It's time for another episode of Grant Draws. Uh, our guest today is... Still waking up. <laughs> yeah, so, well, we're both still working up. <laughs> this is Alan Forbes. Uh, I guess goes by Vagabond to Alan. On pretty much all my socials, so. And we are going to be continuing this, the discussion we had last week about how he creates his comic books. Um, and just like last week, we both have Kickstarters. Um, my Kickstarter is doing pretty well. Uh, we're getting close at, at the time that I say this, it's getting close to the $3,000 mark, which would mean it would unlock the next stretch goal. Oh, nice. Um, so yeah, my comic book is called the League of Cryptids. If you guys don't know about it already, I'm assuming you guys know about it if you're watching my show, but if you guys don't, please go check it out on Kickstarter, and I will put the link in the show notes. As always, Grant Draws is sponsored by the Independent Creative Directory, and I think I explained to you what the Independent Creative Directory was last week, right, Alan? Yeah, we talked a little bit about it. I mentioned I had, I had joined the Facebook page. Uh, so I think we covered that, but, uh, a little summary could never hurts, right? Yeah. Um, so th for the audience, the independent creator directory is basically the internet movie database, but for independent creators, not just comic book creators, but, uh, people who maybe have like a, a YouTube show, um, maybe people who do like board game design, that sort of thing. So yeah, so the independent creative directory is pretty cool. So let's get to the topic of this episode. Uh, Alan, I think you remember where we, we left off, right? Yes. Yeah, last week we had uh, I'd worked all the way up to a certain point in my uh, kind of uh, demo project here uh, with our little uh, hero and his... Um, uh, accomplice, sidekick, robots, uh, his hovercraft, or hover bike and stuff in this sci-fi setting. Uh, I was basically explaining how I put together a scene. Um, when you think about comic books, right, you know, they're, they're like storyboards. Um, oftentimes, uh, storyboards themselves are created in a comic book-like format uh, to illustrate how a project would come about. Um, and a guide to creating more in-depth projects like television shows, movies, and things like that, animation and stuff. And um, the programs that I'm using, or the main program I'm using is Poser, which is a 3D, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a 3D program that started out as a virtual artist mannequin kind of program all those years ago in version one. 
and it literally just had humans that you could float in the scene and i think you could put some basic primitives in there so like a cube or a, a cone or something like that so you could kind of represent things and you could control lighting and the colors of the figures and stuff and over time it developed into a pretty robust program uh you can customize content you can bring in a lot of pre-made content doesn't really offer a lot of modeling it's more of a composition and rendering program uh, but it also has some animation features i'm going to talk a little bit about those today because those animation features are how i break down my scenes into panels um occasionally you know i'll have a, uh, a a moment in my comic that's like one or two panels and so then i might just do a single file for that but if i've got like a whole action sequence or something and all the players in that sequence are in one place it just makes sense to create a essentially a keyframe uh sequence using the animation tools and then render it each frame as its own image and then import them into my page layout software to you know set up my panels and lay out the comic uh so we're gonna go do a little more into that last week we did uh we kind of built out this scene that you see in front of you here uh, where we where i talked about uh how i uh, cast the character how i pose the character like a choreographer how i uh, costumed the character and then how i you know lo you know scouted the location and brought in props and um and uh, special effects in the form of the robots and things like that. Um, and played with lighting and stuff like that. So wore a lot of the hats already, but we're gonna wear a few more hats today. Cool. So that kind of gets us up to speed. Now, uh, one of the things about Poser is that Poser gives you, like many 3D programs, a range of options when it comes to rendering. Uh, that's where you take the preview mode that we see here and as I demonstrated last time, there are multiple types of preview modes. Some are better for things like trying to uh, to see how um, objects and figures in the scene are interacting with each other because um, 3D programs won't prevent things like the physical world where you can poke things through. Um, for example, let me go ahead and throw in a primitive here. Just gonna show you some of the uh, ideas in case anybody's wondering what a primitive is. Uh, here's a little pyramid. I'm gonna toss in my scene. And as you can see, the pyramid doesn't care that there are other things in the scene. It just pops where it wants to. And right. so it's currently embedding my figure and things like that. So yeah. these things uh, require a little extra care. Um, Popping right out of that pyramid. Yeah, exactly. Um, which can be cool if you do something like, let me go into my material settings. And let me go ahead and undo my movements. There we go. And if I wanted to make something like, let's do a clear plastic on the pyramid. Yep. And did it do it? Okay. All right. Let me go ahead and look at my material settings for that. Why is my pyramid? Yeah, my pyramid is transparent. Okay, so let's see what happens when we do a quick render. I'm gonna go to my render settings. I use a lot of keyboard shortcuts. Anybody who works with computers for any length of time probably knows about keyboard shortcuts. I hope people are aware of keyboard shortcuts and I don't have to explain keyboard shortcuts. Yeah, um, I don't use a lot of shortcuts, but just like, like the basic ones. For me, it carries over from my days working in graphic design and things like that where you know, keyboard shortcuts were the key to getting things done on, on time and under budget. Um, spent a lot of time, you know, doing a lot of the same behaviors over and over again. Um, and so I, you can see here as it's rendering out the scene and you can kind of get a sense too, as you're watching this render out of how the rendering process works. It starts by making big pixels and then refines each of those pixels. So it kind of starts very rough four bit, two bit, if you will, and eventually gets down to a million bit, you know, like it, it builds out each pixel and breaks it into sections and then breaks that into sections. And that's how it creates the detail. And that's how it works for a physics based renderer like this one that I'm using. Uh, there are other types of renderers that do kind of like line by line or row by row kind of rendering. Um, it's like a sculptor chipping away at it. Yeah, exactly. You start with broad strokes or like a painter, you lay down the big, you know, flats of color and then you start painting in your details um, like Bob Ross. Uh, but anyway, so we can see in the quick render here that he's standing inside a glass pyramid of sorts. And uh, so, you know, there are ways to make that work in a scene. 
Uh, but in this case, too, we can see that that energy pyramid or plastic glass pyramid is cutting through the, um, the hover bike, for example. So I'm going to go ahead and cancel this out for now because uh, we don't need to see the whole thing here. And we're going to see the uh, smoothing effect that kicks in there, uh, which is actually part of the intentional uh, process for me. Uh, it was this kind of like, because as you look at this right now, you can see that you've got some uh, kind of like, softer details you know sort of the smoothing effect that makes it feel almost painterly that's kind of the key to why i use a uh, lower resolution rendering because then that smoothing effect gives it that kind of appearance and I actually set up a couple of examples which i'm going to go ahead and open up here that kind of demonstrate this so let me go back into where is it Okay, let me go back into here. Let me do an open. And uh, okay, I'm in the right spot, right? Um, hmm. Doc, no, documents. Okay, this is right. Yep. There's tester low and tester high. Okay. Bring this in. Okay, and then we'll open two more. So these are a couple of renders that I made ahead of time uh, since the last time we recorded. And so there's, this is the... Looking pretty. This is the low res. So this is kind of a medium quality shot here. Let me move this out of his face. There we go. And let me zoom in on this one so we can see. All right, I think that was enough. <laughs> okay, so if you'll notice here, you can kind of see it uh, between these two images. On the one on the left, you've got more detail. You can see a little more of like the, the hairs on his chin, and uh, you can see a little more separation in the eyebrows, a little bit more detail in the hair and things like that, and even in the patterns and stuff. And on the right, you see it's got a little less detail but it's got a little more smoothness. It almost looks painted rather than rendered. And that's been kind of the key to my process because then when I apply my various filters to it, I end up with something like this. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that same thing here. So here's the, oh, okay. and then this is the, so here's the low and here's the high. And so as you can notice in the high res, you get a lot more like noise, you know, like you can see around in the forehead and stuff like right over here. We you get a lot kind of more. You know what it kind of reminds me of? Hmm. I don't know if, how much you have used Photoshop, but it kind of reminds me of like some of the filters that you can put on like photographs. Well, like I, know, <clears throat> like I remember back in the day, I mean, now that AI exists, people probably don't do this anymore. But people used to like take photographs and put like a watercolor filter on it and be like, hey, look, I watercolored this. Right. Well, that's actually kind of what I'm doing. I am actually in Photoshop right now with these images. Oh. Um, so after I've done my renders, I bring them into Photoshop and I apply a series of filters to give it even more of this kind of like hand drawn and painted kind of look. So up close, I can see some of that that kind of pixelization and stuff like that. But when I'm zoomed out far, I get nice solid blocks of color, which gives it more of a comic booky kind of feel. Right. I like, you know, we, as we all like to verb everything. So, so you can kind of see here in these two versions and this is more personal preference than anything else. But what's nice is that since I like what I'm getting out of the lower quality renders, I'm not waiting as long for the renders to be done because rendering takes a long time and the higher quality the render, the longer it takes. And so by being, by coming up with this kind of technique of ha being able to use these low quality renders and bringing them into Photoshop, um, it's definitely saved me a lot of time. It made it possible to produce the comics in a relatively short period of time. Right. You know, I'm not at the point where I can do this on a monthly basis yet, but I imagine I could get there if I needed to, uh, at the very least bi-monthly. So yeah, if I, that, I, you know, I mean, I don't know very many independent comic books that run on a monthly or bi-monthly right schedule i mean i remember when i first started doing this that was the goal and then i realized that in the grand scheme of things that's not really realistic uh, yeah. yeah 
right. I mean, I mean, the Kickstarter alone takes a month, and then you have like two weeks to get your money, and then you have like another two weeks to get the proof from the the printer. So, like, yeah, doing a monthly independent comic book really isn't all that realistic. And in theory, you could build up to that point, but you know, when you're first starting out, I mean, this is my first campaign, and I can celebrate that I'm at thirty percent or so funded at this point through the first week. Um, I hit twenty plus backers. I, mean, I think I'm at twenty two right now. You, uh, you know I, what? I'm I'm really sorry. We forgot to promote your. your <laughs> we got time. We'll get there. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I guess I was. I, I guess I'm so self absorbed. I was. I was talking about. <laughs> My, um, um, my, I was talking so much about my Kickstarter, I forgot that I had to talk about yours. Uh, so if, I mean, obviously I'll put the, the link in, in the show notes. Yeah. But, um, open up my, since I'm sharing my whole screen, I can actually go to mine and, uh, let's see, where is it? Here we go. So this is my project. Let's go to view project here. There we go. Uh, so, okay, stop with the menu that drop down menu. Okay. Um, so yeah, I'm at about 30% funded. I'm 22 backers so far. I got 20 days to go. I got a series of get to know me updates up as well as our first milestone was unlocked. Um, there is a, if you check out my Kickstarter, there is a project video and there's a, an original song in that video and it's used throughout the video and another video that's there in my project. Um, I'm going to be releasing that song as, a, as like a, the full length version as the uh, official Red Cat theme song. You wrote so, this song? Uh, I created it in uh, GarageBand, yeah. Oh, cool. um, quite a bit of customization. I had a, a friend of mine who's a musician. He gave me some notes, and so he's my official producer on it. <laughs> um, but I, and then I've made variations on it in GarageBand to use throughout the uh, videos, uh, including a little jazzy version at the very end of my first video. And, um, and then there's like so in the course of creating that song, I created a few others that were other possible themes because I think very, I'm a very visual storyteller. And when, even when making comics, I think about them in, in terms of their, their movement and things. And so I was originally thinking of building my kind of my, my marketing and theme. And there's still a little bit of that in there around the idea of a TV show, right? Because the main character, Red Cat, in his day job, he's a stuntman, an aspiring actor. And so he's trying to make it big and land a speaking role and things like that. And uh, so I had this whole kind of TV show theme kind of going. And so I created his theme song. And uh, so that's our first unlock is a, uh, is a digital download of that theme song for everyone. So, so it was kind of cool about that. And I'm hoping to get to the point where we can unlock uh, the entire um, EP of uh, the other songs and that I created for the project as well. So, Neat. so yeah, one of my many dabblings is in, uh, is in, uh, in the music side of things. I have no formal training. I just have an ear for what I think sounds cool. So, and I've gotten some good uh, input from people over the years on that. So it's been nice. And I think that's a lot of musicians, honestly. And the thing is, is like music is, has such a way, a power way of helping us to remember things. Um, connect, combining uh, more than one sense is uh, kind of key to help forming stronger memories. So I always like to incorporate there we go. So yeah, um, so this is a, this is a, a kind of a close up here. So we're so we're at this point, I'm going to go ahead and show my render settings. I go to my render here, and I can just start a render. Or I can go in here and play with the various settings. So when I open up the options window, I'm using the Superfly renderer. Uh, Superfly is a physics based renderer uh, based on the cycles. Um, I'm sorry, material room is based on cycles. That's different. Uh, so supervise this renderer. And it has lots of options, lots of features. Um, uh, Poster's original quality renderer was this thing called Firefly, which did more like a lot of simulations for real physics and things like that. And then it has this sketch render feature. So for those who want to play around with Poser's attempts to make uh, things more artistic, uh, I'll go ahead and demonstrate a quick one here. This one is the pencil and ink one. And I'm going to render that sketch real quick just to see what that looks like. The thing about this one is that it has always been a little tricky. Um, the results have not always been ideal. This one is messing with, yeah, because it doesn't really support some of the transparency features. 
um, that allow like smooth edges around the, the hairlines and stuff. So hasn't always been uh, one that I found useful, but some people will swear by it and love it. So it's been there a long time. Um, again, as Composer has um, has grown over the years, it has uh, added more and more features. Um, we can see in here too, there's a movie settings. We'll talk about that in a little bit. And then there's this preview mode. So if I wanted to just like make a nice, um, let's say for example, preview mode would be real handy if you want to make a higher quality uh, shot of say this view. So if I wanted to, people to see my wireframe, I could go into here and I could do a preview render and it'll give me a little bit of a kind of an anti-aliased higher quality one. So I could actually scale this up. So like I'm looking at this preview and as I'm using the app, I only see this preview. But if I wanted a bigger image of this to show detail, I could do that. Um, which I've used in the past in some effects. I actually did a project a while ago uh, that's available on Indie Planet called uh, The Binary Twins. There's a compilation in Indie Planet. Um, the Binary Twins was a comic, a set of comic strips that I did for a friend of mine's magazine he ran for a few years, uh, a few years back. It was a video game magazine for kids. And he, uh, he asked me to do kind of this comic strip in there. And so I had these characters, these robots. And so I used the combination of the regular renders, which are done in a kind of a cartoony style, and then this view. And I would overlay this wireframe on the top of it to give it kind of like this digitized look, kind of look. Right. And let me see if I can find an example of that. Uh, search binary twins. <coughs> Yeah, for anybody who remembers the old Highlights magazine uh, back in the day, uh, here's an example. Highlights magazine used to have this um, this series called Goofus and Gallant, um, where Goofus was the bad kid and Gallant was the good kid, and it was supposed to be these morality lesson kind of stuff. And so we basically came up with a video game version of that with the two, the one and zero, the binary twins. And so zero is the bad robot, and one's the good robot, and uh, so this is an example of how I would use a combination of the renders. I'd render it out and then I would render the wireframe and then I would overlay that in Photoshop and end up with this look. And so this was kind of like the look that I had throughout the series. And I did a total of, I think, 12 or 13 issues. Um, and so this was a lot of fun, just kind of experimenting. And we had two different types of strips. We had the main strip, which would, which would have a topic like, be careful. This one was uh, one that we came up with during the time when Pokemon Go was really popular. And kids were hurting themselves playing Pokemon Go. So we were reminding them, please be careful when you're using your devices. Um, and then we would have this thing called Take a Break, which would be a single panel kind of reminding people to stop playing video games and do something else for a minute. <laughs> um, so this was, this was a really fun project that I got to work on for a while. And uh, here's some, I even did a little behind the scenes kind of thing here where I demonstrated how I made the stuff in Poser and how I gave them their looks and created the effects. And then, so yeah. So like I said, that one's on uh, Indie Planet. So, and then, uh, but yeah, so you got these different render engines. And so I generally now use the Superfly one. And when I go to Superfly, I have a number of different settings that I tend to turn on. Uh, one of these is that I'll set my dimensions. Usually I'll use, when I'm doing like test renders, I use the preview window. But when I want to make a final image, I'm going to make it bigger. And so then I'll change my resolution here. And then um, I can set up depth of field. So that's where we, I think we talked about that last time where you get, you can oh, right. create that illusion of depth. And then the uh, post effects. So this is a newer feature and like sort of like poster 12, I think, uh, where you can specify uh, that, that kind of like denoising effect so that your grainy picture becomes less grainy and it creates that kind of like controlled blur. Uh, there's also a feature called Bloom. Bloom is this feature where you can control some of the after effect glow. So rather than trying to get it in scene, because sometimes it can be challenging to get lights to behave exactly like the real world versions uh, in scene, um, you can actually do an effect where you cause it to kind of like create a little like of that glow, especially see it at night a lot of times when you see that halo effect around lights and stuff. Cool. Um, and so I actually have an example of that in this right here. So this is, I'm working on, and I'm hoping to unlock a bonus feature here. This is a, this would be a Kickstarter exclusive short story prequel scene. Uh, so this would be an eight pager. 
um, where we show a, an introduction of a character that appears later in the miniseries. And as you look at this window in the background, if you can see I'm circling here, uh, it's got this kind of effect where the light is kind of spilling out a little bit. Oh, okay. That is created by that bloom uh, post effect. And so Poser having post effects is a really relatively new feature. So it can do some of the stuff in Poser that you would normally have to do in Photoshop. Um, anytime you can do stuff in Poser, you're going to end up with a result that's a little easier to control once you're doing your, you know, post editing. Uh, but there are plenty of things. Wait, cancel. Uh, there are plenty of things that I do that uh, I save for Poser. Um, certain kind of effects, special effects and things like that, that I might want to do. Um, but one of the cool things is that Poser even supports motion blur. As we saw here in the settings here, um, right here, motion blur, where you can, you know, use your animation to create, your animation palette to create a, an effect of something moving and the motion blur that goes with it. And there's actually an example of that on, uh, where is it? Let me think here. Where's a good example of that? Okay, let's put this away. I used motion blur on a scene. Um, I use it a couple of ways. You can have something move in the scene, and the uh, you can have the character moving in the scene, and so you can create kind of like a speedster effect or a, a quick like swing in a mist. Oh, I know exactly what you're talking about. Um, That's cool. And I just did one. Where is the most recent? Oh yeah, it was action packed. So as part of my my weekly email here. So here's an example of motion blur where you can see certain parts of like they're moving, his foot's moving across and things like that. This one doesn't always give you the result you want because when you think about like in comics, a lot of times motion blur is represented with like, like this light trail effect where things like they draw lines off the figure to kind of show them running and stuff like that. And it's always been a little tricky to kind of pull off, but I discovered an alternative motion and blur effect because that's exaggerated. That's um that cartoony kind of motion blur is meant to make it very obvious that things are moving. In the real world, a lot of times things are just blurry. And so um, Poser tends to be kind of limited in that respect. But I discovered that there's another way to create high speed motion by having the character stand still and move the background. Um, and that can create a very cool effect. And I have some examples of that on, uh, let's see if I can find one here. And okay, so let's go to my audition short story and let's look at page one. All right, so you can see here the motorcycle's still, and I had the background, the cityscape flying by. And so it created that really cool kind of tunneling blur effect. Oh, yeah. I see what you know. mean. So, so yeah, like I said, there's different ways you can achieve that, but um, that's pretty much how we go through the process of creating the stills. Now, Right now, I have one panel. I have my character standing there. He has the robot behind him. Um, maybe the robot just entered the room, okay? Or maybe the robot's going to leave. I don't know. Over here on the uh, right, as I'm circling it here, is the uh, keyframe uh, kind of timeline here. At the bottom is the actual animation timeline. If I go over here to the play button, I hit play right now, nothing happens as it kind of flies through in previews because I haven't created any animation. So what I'm going to do is first kind of show how I could create an animation effect of like maybe him turning to look at the other guy a little bit. So I'm going to go to my keyframe 30 here and I'm going to go ahead and select everything uh, by shift clicking there and I had a plus. So now I've added these keyframes and we can see everything went green here and now I'm going to go ahead and create a different pose here. I'm going to take my main figure and I'm going to go ahead and pose him. And I need to grab the right thing here. Let's rotate him so he can look towards the robot more. Okay, there's his belly. So we're going to rotate him that way. Let's turn him that way. Okay. And he's going to kind of do this thing where we're going to move that arm. Let's move this arm. All right. Something simple here, and I'm going to go ahead and rotate this so I can get him pointing. Now I go pre-use one of the hand poses because 
posing hands can be quite a pain. So I like to pre, I like to start with a preset one. So I'll go ahead and use the point one, add it to his left hand. All right. And the thing is, is like I can make, um, I can make adjustments to it further if I want to. I can use my hand camera. So, so this is one of the things that I've been curious about while you were talking. Yep. I'm curious more about like how you, you pose the different like you get some of like the fight scenes and like I mean obviously like right now he's kind of just standing there. Right. Um <clears throat> But I've, I've been curious about how you get, like, some of the action poses that might be in your comic book. Right. Yeah, exactly. Um, let me just do a little bit more there. Okay. So, the um, as I mentioned, the idea, like, that there's this pre-made content. It's like, they, they talk about a lot of times, like, in movies when the, uh, the costumer buys stuff off the rack, right? Yeah. So, there's a lot of stuff already ready to go that you can acquire... Uh, some free, some paid. I've acquired a lot over the years. I kind of, it's its challenging for someone getting started now because I've built up a library years ago that I'm currently utilizing and I still have to buy things on occasion. Um, it, it can be trickier to get into it now and then, you know, how much of an investment there is with that content. And uh, we'll go ahead and do this. But what, what, what kind of money are you talking um, well, the hobby industry used to be a little bit cheaper, but let me go ahead and open up a popular website. The one that actually currently owns Poser is a company called Renderosity. And so I'm going to Renderosity's website. Now, Renderosity supports both Poser and Daz, but they currently own Poser. Um, and so they have a lot of content here. And you can see, for example... Sometimes they'll give away the base figures. Now, Poser does cost. Das Studio and its base does not. But da Poser is pretty much all-in feature-rich, whereas Daz is kind of bare bones and you have to pay for add-ons. Um, so that's kind of the trick there. You can still do decent stuff with just the base program, but maybe not everything you want to do. And so when you look at some of these examples here, you can see some, you know, here's a hair for a figure, a hair model and textures, that's like on sale. It's normally sixteen fifty. It's down to eight twenty five. You got a village scene here. I can go ahead and show you what that might look like. And so you have the scene. So if you're scouting scenes and everything, uh, right. marketplace. How much is this? Uh, this one is on sale for ten bucks. Um, let's go ahead and look at. So I'm going to go that ahead. Doesn't and, really make sense. So you're saying like, like, a, a hair texture would cost more than an entire village? I mean, well, I so that wasn't just a hair texture. It was the hair itself with all the textures and any modifications. So like posing it and stuff like that. So look, let's look at some scenes here. So here's a here's a uh, modular mall or let's look, let's go with our sci-fi theme, right? Let's say I wanted to create an office scene in there. And so I go ahead and I look at this model and this is Colony Office. And you can see it can includes all these pieces and it includes uh, some of the different render sets and things. And so as I go through the previews of this product, I can see that you have the interior without props. You have the interior with props. Um, you've got an exterior. So this scene actually is part of a whole set piece. Um, so I could then import this into my scene, whether that backdrop is Mars or some other location. And if I so if I wanted this set, it's got a lot of options and everything. And then I import it in and I can use it. And so this one would set me back. It's currently on sale for $13.20. So a lot of times you kind of like, for me, it's like I have my monthly or quarterly budget for new content. Um, and so years, I acquired a lot of that content. And um, some of the content I got for free because it was like trades. So when I was creating content, there was other content creators that I would trade content with. They'd give me a, a legit copy of their product and I'd give them a legit copy of mine, you know, that kind of thing. Or if they were doing marketing and stuff like that, I'd be like, here, use my poses and your promotional pieces. So like if you're promoting a character, let me go back to this here, for example. Let's say I was creating a new character for a base figure. Remember how we changed, we had the base figure that we brought in with his boxer shorts last week. And then we changed his whole appearance. So if you had a base figure and you wanted to change uh, their appearance, here's a good example. And uh, so this is like an updated appearance. And so you'd have all these tons of options here. Uh, changing the makeup, changing the eye color, uh, changing various aspects of the nails and things like that. 
uh, changing the lips and stuff. And the thing is too, is you can do some mix and matching. So like I can sometimes, depending on how good the care, the content creator was, I might be able to take the, um, the lips from one, uh, that are exactly the color I want and put it on the, uh, the materials, uh, set from another character. And so when it, so that's how we go, through, that's where I get the content. And so I'm gonna go back into uh, Poser now. And so over here on the far right, I have my library. And in my library, I have what are called run times, um, which I believe is a carryover from Python and things like that. Um, and so the run times are these folder structures and I created folder structures for each kind of theme. So I have human figures in a couple of different versions. I have animals, I have, and of course my stupid menu thing doesn't show um, the breakdown there, but I can show you in the folder structure out here. So let me go here and let me go to my documents folder, my master runtimes folder. All right, there's my completed. And so you can see, for example, I have um, the various human figures, animal beast, humanoid other, when we get, went to get the robot, I found the robot and humanoid other. This was another company that made some figures. These are my robots that I made for that comic strip. Uh, this is another figure. Then you have clothing and I categorize my clothing by figure type and genre. So I have clothing that's like fantasy and historical. I have sci-fi and modern. I have multi-use, meaning the product is generic enough that it could be used in multiple settings. Uh, then I have hairs. So I have female only hairs, male only hairs and unisex. Hairs that can be used on either. In fact, the hair that we used on the figure was a unisex hair. Uh, then I have uh, props. So I have weapons separate from other accessories, standalone materials. So there are people who make collections of just materials to change the surface look of the figures. Uh, my scenes, indoor, outdoor, uh, various collections, some of the more prolific makers I've created all ones. I did a children's book a while back that was set in a medieval setting. So I have a whole set of scenes that are medieval based so I could find those easily. And then vehicles. So like air and space vehicles, land vehicles, sea vehicles. So that's like, <clears throat> that gives you an idea of like how deep my libraries go. Um, and so that's where I get to where I create the content and so, or I, I you know, use the content is there. But then I can customize further. Um, I can make my own textures if I want. So in the case of Red Cat, for example, his, his, um, the top on him, which I can show you here, or actually even from Poser. So for example, if I look at this render, ah, this was a big one. So I gotta find my preview renders. Here's an example of preview render. Um, so this top here, the original figure didn't have this extra patterning that was customization that I did in Photoshop to give it that extra layer of, you know, superhero pattern effect. Um, oh, okay. Because if I go here to my clothing and I go to that figure and load it up, you can see that the figure, DZ Fire, I think the mark top, where was it? Maybe it doesn't make that match. There it is. So when you look at this figure, for example, uh, let me go ahead and go back to preview so we can see a pop-up in the scene. Uh, let's see, smart top sleeveless. Okay, so this was the figure that I brought into, and now I got to take him out of the, uh, there we go, let's bring it forward. So this was the figure, and as you can see, as I apply a texture to it, where is it, there we go. Top. Okay, so I'm going to apply just a base color here so we can see. So when you apply a base color to it here, you can see that this is the pattern it normally comes with. So when I bought this and brought it into my library, it came with this pattern. So to create the effect of these extra lines and that extra layer and the, the three-dimensional aspects of that with the seams and stuff, that was all customization that I did using Photoshop to modify the flat material uh, files, the JPEGs and whatnot, that I then imported to wrap around the figure to give it that distinct look. So that's kind of that process as far as getting the content in here. 
And then the same thing goes for like posing the content. There are all these different poses that you can get to that are kind of pre-made. And here's some examples from my set uh, that I made. I called it the caught in the moment uh, set. And I used a lot of real world reference materials. So over here on the right of my library, you can see the various poses. And most content users, people who buy content, love it when you make a pose and then make the mirror pose. So if the character is standing pointing to the left, now they you have the exact opposite one where they're pointing to the right. And a lot of times that's just the starting point. Once you find the pose you want to use, then you load that pose, you double click to load it in, and then you can modify it further. Now over here on the left, I have my editing tools. You can see as I'm circling over here, hopefully. And the ones that I most commonly use to rotate and move the figure are the select, are pretty much the rotate, the translate, and the twist. So if I wanted to spin this arm, I could use the twist tool and I could just come over here and click and drag to twist the arm, okay? If I wanted to move it, rotate it, turn it around, I use the rotate tool, grab onto the arm and move it around. Now, sometimes I have too many pieces in place, meaning that I have a lot of overlap. I've got a figure and like, like right here on his chest, I have his chest, I have the shirt he's wearing and the vest he's wearing. And so sometimes in order to make the pose work right, I want to be able to grab like his abdomen and make that twist, right? But if I accidentally grab the, the shirt, sometimes I could end up accidentally moving the, depending on how it's set up, I might move the clothing instead of the figure. Um, so that's where I could use these dials to make those adjustments as well in this parameter palette. So, so there's a lot of pieces, a lot of moving parts. All right. But we got to the point now where we have this this kind of like really simplified animation so when i hit the play button i can see what it does all right and this is going to be very um simplified preview because it takes a lot of uh computing power to render out an animation because you're doing that rendering time 30 times all right for a 30 second or 30 frame which 30 frames a second means this is one second of animation right now, this would be moving way too fast if I render this out into a movie. So I have to be conscious of that. I have to give myself a lot more frames if I'm doing a real-time kind of animation. But this isn't how... I mean, this kind of gives you the idea of like what Poser's tools are capable of doing, but this isn't how I use them. What I do instead... So I'm going to grab this 30-frame moment here, and I'm going to go ahead and bring this back to frame 2 frame 30 here okay so now i have frame one where he's standing there i have frame two where he's there now i want to create this since this scene is a little bit more of a dramatic moment i might want to rotate him because in my last panel he was just standing there but in this new panel he is engaging with him so there's different word balloons and there's different things going on all right, so I move this here, and I move this here, and the robot's like, who, me? And we're going to go ahead and rotate this. Let's twist this out. And he's feeling pretty defensive. And I was like, I didn't do it, I swear. Okay, all right, so now you can see how first panel of the page, second panel of the page. Oh, okay, cool. All right. And so then I can do that. So let's say I have 20 panels on my page. I can use 20 of my frames to create those, all right? And that's how I can build out a more complex scene. So like a fight sequence, all right? Let's go ahead and do one more where maybe uh, my dude has had enough. So let's go to my comic pose pack. And what's cool is that some people have actually created for me some presets uh, where two figures are fighting, for example. So I'm going to go ahead and see which one of these I want to use. <laughs> All right. Let me go ahead and let's see here. All right. I think we'll do this one. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead now and I'm going to make on panel three here. 
Uh, let me go ahead. Now, one thing I do a lot of times is I get the whole panel uh, keyframed in so that there's less chance of it kind of doing weird tweening in between. So now I've got my dude here and I'm going to move him over. Let me change my angle to this side kind of thing here. And I can move this in and I'm going to try to make him. And I realize now that he needs to be punched the other way. So let's go back to here. Let me make sure that I am doing that. Debate. And am I still on my? Nope. I will. Let's make sure I apply that. Okay. And now I got to move him back. So let me use my other camera to get him into place. Okay. I'm going to rotate him like so. And we're going to go ahead and move him to the robot. So somehow he got over the hover bike right away. And uh, he's going to be taking a swing at him. And he figures he has a shot because of cybernetic arm. All right. So, and I'm going to rotate him. Oh, wrong way. Let's try oh, this it. could be your next comic book. Yep, exactly. If, you, if your next comic book is uh, cybernet, cybernetic arm dude, I don't, I don't know where you got the idea. Exactly. All right. So I get him roughly positioned, and now, because I used a custom pose, or like a preset pose, I may not have exactly what I want here. So I'm going to bring his face around because I need to be able to see it. I mean, he's punching at him, but I need to see his expression. He's mad. And now the robot is going to dodge it because the robot isn't that... Um, okay. The robot is not that... Um, not just going to stand there. Robot's feeling like, I don't need to take this. So let me go ahead and get him posed. Now, the thing about sometimes the pre-made content is that you might have a pose. Because if we remember correctly, we were looking at this pose here. We were using this fight sequence here. The, my, the pose sometimes works fine with other figures and sometimes does not. And so, did I do the right one here? Let's see. Let's move him. Because I don't want him to get punched. I'm going to go ahead and see if, yeah, we're going to do that. We're going to undo that. Undo that. Okay. Let's go ahead and let's give him a different. There we go. So I can mix and match my poses, all right? And I can rotate this, and he can be like, whoa. And I'm suddenly remembering the moment in the original Sam Raimi Spider-Man when Spider-Man, when Peter Parker was moving so weak, like he was so like aware, like the punch came slow motion from Flash and he just kind of watched it go by his face kind of thing. All right. So now I've got this new sequence, right? And I can change my angle and play with it till I get it where I want it. So I can play with my drama and everything else, right? And this turn is a little much. There we go. How's my side to side? Okay. All right. So now we got punch sequence, right? And so now as I go back through my timeline, let's go back to the beginning. He's standing here. Didn't hear that guy come in. Guy came in. He's like, you, I'm going to get you. And then he comes in for the punch. And so now you can see how in my one file, I have uh, three panels of my page already. All right. Now, we don't have time for all these to render out, but I will demonstrate how that rendering process works. Actually, we do if we do low quality. So I'm going to go ahead and do that render process. I'm going to use my animation rendering tools. So I go to my render settings again, and I make sure that my render is set up the way I want it. So I'm going to turn off the depth of field because I haven't had time to set it, and that takes longer to render. And this is just a demonstration. I'm going to make sure my render dimensions are the preview window. Okay, uh, we'll keep the post effects going. We'll go progressive refinement is fine. And then I go over here to my movie settings. And this is where I can specify that I want to use my high quality renderer. And I want to do frames one through three because I don't need images for all those other frames I didn't use. And I'm going to go ahead and I'm not going to make a movie out of it because when it renders, it renders each frame of the animation and then converts that into a single movie file. 
but I can turn that off so I end up with a series of just images. And the formatting is going to be fine there. Actually, I'll do the JPEG version there. And I'm going to do the I'm going to do the preview size here. Okay. And then I'm going to change the location. We're going to go out to our documents there. And we're going to call this tester scene. Okay. All right. So that's going to render out. We'll let that render scene begin. And it goes pretty quickly because I did, you know, three essentially low quality uh, renders. Let's see how those turned out. I'm wondering if I did them right. Uh, let's see. Go back to my documents. And let's look at tester scene one, two, three. Something is wrong. Uh oh. For whatever reason, that did not render the way it was supposed to. Let me so, see why. just for reference, Alan, yeah, so we try we try to keep these videos like around an hour. Yep. And we're at fifty minutes. Like I'm not saying that it has to be exactly an hour or anything, but I'm, yeah, I'm being. So you know, I'm trying to be conscious of that. But how long, how far in are we now? Fifty minutes. Fifty minutes. Okay. All right, well, uh, this uh, went pretty quick here. Hopefully this worked this time. And then, so let's see. It did not work this time. Okay, why is this not rendering that? Let me try one more thing here. Hmm. So it's, it seems like there's a lot of problem solving involved in in working like this. Sometimes. Um, there's just certain things that can happen in the process here. Let me see if that first one turned out okay. Okay. I'm not going to try to problem solve why that's not working right now. But I'm going to go ahead and go into Illustrator here and kind of show an example. Actually, let's do it with my previews here. Um, let's do a new one here. Nope. Close. Let's go into uh, here. So here's a quick little preview of the next thing I'm working on. Let's see here. Additional short story. Where's my working file? Oh boy. That's weird. Okay. I don't know where I went. Maybe it's over here. All right, so here's an example when I've rendered out a batch of images. Okay, here's some examples uh, from my upcoming issue. Let me go ahead and go to the, let's see if I can find it. It's probably not here. Okay, so I do a batch. So here's like 11 frame sequence, okay? So these are 11 images. I'm going to go ahead and preview these. And so these are the renders panel by panel, all right? Make sense? Yeah. Straightforward action sequence, you know? And so then I import those into Photoshop and I do my filtering. And then I come into Illustrator and I do a layout. And so let's see if I can find. Okay. Let's go to my cloud documents. There's issue one. Okay, I'm going to let that load for a moment. I'm going to be mad at uh, Poser later. That's everything. I pretty much showed everything that I do in Poser at this point. 
um, and try not to lose my mind when that stuff happens as I try to figure out why it's happening later. Maybe next time. All right. Waiting for Illustrator to load it. These files get pretty big uh, once you start creating all the elements of it. Um, but I use Illustrator to lay out my pages. And uh, I know some people will use other applications. I think there's a one called Comic Life that some people might use, things like that. And uh, But with Illustrator, I do all of the layout and lettering in there. And uh, so, as you might have noticed, I do the, um, the renders are all square, right? Um, but my panels are not. And so, come on, Illustrator. Oh, my goodness. Can you do that faster? Seriously. Um, Okay, let's hide Photoshop so it's not trying to demo that. <sighs> Sometimes I end up leaving these files open for a while because of how long it takes them to, uh, or this is like a great moment to like take a coffee break, you know, things like that. Right. But yeah, this is why I can't do a comic a month. <laughs> of course, part of it too is that I'm using an older, older uh, Mac. My um, my Mac is from 2019, so they don't give you a discount since you I work. You get a discount, but even with the discount, those things can still be a little pricey. So I'm due for one, and I'm planning on getting one here soon. Um, a successful campaign would definitely help <laughs> towards that. So as we uh, work towards that, okay. Any second now. Any second now. All right. Let me go ahead and show an example of a finished comic here. Oh, where is my I'm kind of surprised that's not in there. I'll have to figure that out later because I thought I'd put that in there. Okay. And uh, let's see here. Let's go to my issues. I don't have issues. I promise I'm not issues. Okay. Uh, there we go. <laughs> Maybe I should have done this more. A little preview faster. Probably not. Yeah, my uh, my GPU is definitely being taxed right now. All right, doesn't normally take that long for it to preview things. Well, we can go to my project page and see my previews there. Uh, let's go to campaign because there is a six page preview on the, there we go. Um, so you can see how like I've got tall frames and uh, wide frames and things like that. And so sometimes when I'm rendering those square frames, uh, it doesn't quite fit. And so I'll go in there and I will change my camera to give me more scenes so that I can make a wide shot out of a, or a tall shot out of a square shot. Uh, so I have enough to crop properly and fill the panels. Um, and so here's a good example too, like this particular sequence here we see on the page is like, I wish this stupid thing would get out of the way there. Okay. Um, as we look at these, you can see how like I probably used three frames of the animation panel to create these three sequences. Uh, this panel, this panel, this panel. Because they were tall, I might have had to go in and move my camera back a little bit in order to get it to to uh, give me enough. Because if I had a square, if I was closed in on these guys, I might not have had this extra area at the top there where I had room for my word balloons, you know, stuff like that. And that's the other thing too, like you know, as an artist, you know, doing the, the all the things. One of the things I learned a long time ago was anticipating the word balloons thinking about dead space in your overall where the, the balloons can go without blocking anything. Um, right. That's important too. And sometimes I have to make changes to my, I have to go back and re-render a panel because once I've laid it out, I'm like, I don't have room. Or I have to use tricks like moving text up to the edge of the panel and cutting it off square and things like that. This particular sequence was a fun one. Uh, for those who are familiar with the classic comic book sequences of like, you see this a lot in, in, in uh, comics like Nightwing and stuff like that, where the character 
does you see multiple moves of the character in the single panel uh, uh, the, kind of the DeLuca that. effect. what's that it's called the deluca effect is that what it's called i never knew the name i honest, honestly i'm like thank you I, I had no idea so yes the deluca effect i actually managed to recreate that which meant creating multiple panels uh where the camera didn't move and just the figure did and then kind of ghosting in the ones that weren't the final shot uh and making that work and i even did a really cool sequence which i might be able to share on my youtube well if you had uh my youtube there is uh let me see if it'll even do this YouTube. so i googled it yes it's called the deluca effect excellent so let's go to my youtube channel and um because this and is a really an entire you were you were referencing nightwing they did an entire issue of nightwing that is just the deluca effect oh wow all right, so here's one that I did where I animated it. I don't know if this is working in the stream here. I hope it is. So, yeah, that was something that I created. Um, and again, if anybody wants to see a little better version, they can head to my YouTube channel and check it out there. <laughs> yeah, it is, it is cool that you can do kind of um, like little animations in this program. Yep, exactly. Although that one was done by using the stills and doing uh, using uh, iMovie and Final Cut Pro to create those animations by doing what's essentially the Ken Burns effect in a sense where you're creating motion in a still, you know, you move the image across the screen. To get <laughs> so it's like a, um, like a motion comic book. Exactly. Exactly. Um, which I'm always impressed by some of those because there's a lot of like the ones that where they converted from a pre-existing comic where they're pretty much working from the finished art. Those are tricky, but the ones where they can actually plan to do that ahead of time, um, allows them to kind of see the sequence or to, uh, take pieces out uh, where they can take foreground figures out and move them around separate from the background and things like that. That's when you get very cool, almost cartoony effects. In fact, going back to the very early days of Marvel animation, that's what the principle was in play. You, A lot of the animation sequences were taking a still from the comics and just moving the character across the screen. Captain America would fly across the screen in animation, but it was literally like Captain America himself didn't move. It was just his figure moved across the screen. Some of those early... In fact, let's see if we can find that real quick. As we get close to wrapping, that is never going to open. I swear. Um, let me see if I can go to YouTube again. And I think it was in the '60s. Captain America cartoon, 1966. There we go. When you look at the way these animations would work, they were literally using the panels of the comics. My daughter Natalie was uh, diagnosed with <laughs> stage four neuroblastoma. Okay, all right. Uh, make us feel bad. Simmer down, glamour pants. I'm just changing a curly fuse. But you know the rules. Nobody tampers with the equipment except Tony Stark. Okay, so he lends us his townhouse rent-free. That doesn't make you his official snoop, Grandpa. I'm warning you, you overrated has been. I've been itching for a chance to change that part of your head. No, like I don't. Rats. I'm going out for some fresh air. So that gives you an idea of yeah. the of the kinds of things that are possible when you're talking about like working directly from the comics themselves. Right. Um, so that's yeah, cool. I, yeah, yeah. Motion comic books are something definitely cool. Do you? I mean, do you have some? Do you have interest in doing that maybe in the future? Well, I mean, to little bits and pieces, I don't know. I mean, we originally, my best friend and I, and, and over the years of developing a lot of these ideas and everything, we talked about this notion of um, of plan, of actually creating our digital comics so that they were all formatted to, to the widescreen format. Rather than formatting for the traditional print, we were going to do purely digital, and they were going to be formatted for the screen, meaning that they were all going to be done in widescreen format. Kind of like, uh, I think Frank Miller did that with the 300 comic. Um, right. And so it, it was naturally, the natural progression would be to then, you know, create motion comics using that uh, because the formatting would already be there. And so all of the panels would be rendered as full screen panels. Um, but at one point it was like, 
the technology wasn't quite there yet. We were a little ahead of our time, a little ambitious right. with the ideas. And so it's like, when I think about being able to come in here and do a comic now, all right, finally it loaded. Okay. And uh, so some of you are getting a, a quick preview of my full issue here. But oh, wow. it's like, for example, let's look at a, a good panel um, here. Uh, here's a good example. When I go ahead and look at this. Uh, did you do the lettering as well? I did. Uh, Blambot fonts. Love them. Uh, I do my own sound effects with various fonts as well. And uh, so I did all of that. And so here's an example. Notice how when I'm moving my mouse over this image, you can see this blue frame. Are you able to see that there? Yeah. So that blue frame indicates the full image itself. The actual image is a full rectangular kind of, or almost a full square, but I'm cutting it off. I'm cropping it down to the important area of that image. And so in Poser, I'm not trying to like render some panels wide and some panels tall. I'm rendering them all roughly square, but then I bring them into Illustrator and I do my cropping here to create more traditional comic book layouts. Uh -huh. And so this is how I create my comics. And that's pretty much the complete process. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Alan, for showing us this. Absolutely. It's been my pleasure. I love talking about this stuff. And I think for me, especially in the world of, with the modern world of AI and everything, a lot of us 3D artists that have been working on this stuff for years have already had to deal with a little bit of a stigma around it where people are like, well, that's not traditional comics. That's not hand-drawn. That's just easy. The computer's doing all the work. Well, yeah. But, no, I mean, I think... I, I, I definitely think it's a, a different aesthetic than than the traditionally drawn comic books. Absolutely. And, um, I don't know that I would want to read like every comic book like this, but I, I think it, it is cool. It's definitely different. And I think bringing in that filtering effects brings in a little bit of style because yeah. there's a lot of 3D comics out there um, that other people are doing where they pretty much use pure renders. There's even been some on, uh, on Kickstarter. Um, there was a recent one, uh, that, uh, one of my fellow, uh, Kickstarter friends on Facebook. Um, some of the, one of the people I know there, uh, did one and it, it was more of traditional renders. Uh, there are a few, in fact, if I go to Kickstarter right now, I'm trying to remember if I saved one of these or not, I'd have to go looking for it, but I've seen other people do like traditional, you know, do this 3d comics with these same tools, but I really wanted to, and I myself had done, uh, some previous ones. Uh, here's a good example in the planets. Um, I did some previous ones where I did the more just straight renders and and as you can see, people are doing like AI comics. Here's a here's one here. We can see on uh, Indie Planet that's definitely an AI comic. There's no question about that. There's quite a few of those. Um, but when I go here to Big Bang, which is the um, Big Bang Comics, Big Bang Adventures, uh, Gary Carlson. Uh, this is his project, uh, the newest version of his project. I actually did two of the issues for his project. And I used the 3D tools, but I hadn't developed my style yet. So they're more the pure renders. Here's an example, Big Bang Adventures number 12. And you can see here that the render is pretty much as is. Now, it still looks pretty cool. Um, but it is definitely a obviously rendered comic, right? And uh, here I actually did some filtering. I actually used a couple of different things to create kind of a cartoony effect. Uh, that particular issue, I did multiple different like styles throughout the issue to show the different passages of time. Um, but this was definitely like what I was doing. And then I developed, I started with this particular kind of, uh, issue where I started playing with some of the different filters and eventually settled on this style that I'm using for red cat. And it, pretty much everything that I'm doing now going forward is in this style. In fact, I did some, uh, some tribute pieces for some other people's projects. Uh, there's a project going on right now. There's another Kickstarter right now called uh, going on uh, Sam Johnson's Geek Girl uh, that he has been doing for quite a while. Yeah, right. I, you've mentioned this one before. Yep. And then I recently did a, let's see if it was this one here. Yeah. So this was a, a variant cover I did for his uh, Cabra Sini uh, Interdimensional Hit Woman Um and so I used my same kind of filters and effects to create that look, and he used it as one of his variant covers. 
So that was exciting. Um, and I've done a few of these for a few different people. Um, where's a good one? Juice Man was one um, that's out there. And one of the things that I like to do is once I've crafted the look of another figure in 3D, I can do little crossovers. I can bring Red Cat in. Here's a little right. fast special kind of thing going on. Uh, where he's about to pitch Red Cat. Um, and uh, here's the other one I did of him. And so this is the Juice Man character. And I did my take on that. Uh, Athena Voltaire, Steve Bryant. I've known him for a long time. He's done quite a few things. He did a character named Athena Voltaire. And uh, he also has another character, Evie Van Helsing, that right. he did. And uh, I did an updated version. So this was, I think, the original where I did pure render. And then now I'm starting to use my style on pretty much everything I do. And so this is the stylized version. Yeah. So. Okay. So, so yep. yeah. So there's a lot of other 3D rendered comic books. Um, I was curious. Did you have any closing notes, like anything else you wanted to, to mention about, about the process or anything before we close up the episode? Um. Not really. I think I pretty much covered everything. Let me bring back to StreamYard here. I think I pretty much covered everything as far as um, my process. I mean, there's lots of little details and lots of little tips and tricks and things like that. Um, I'm thinking about doing some behind the scenes stuff as I move through this process um, and doing some kind of like demo videos and things like that. What's cool is that we've kind of created a, 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 a kind of an overview demo video in the course of this process. And I look forward to sharing this uh, on my socials and stuff like that. Um, and kind of getting the other people to be able to see this process, especially on the uh, 3d groups, the fan groups, uh, proposer and dash studio that I, that I'm a part of. Um, but yeah, I think that's pretty much it. The timeline is probably one of my big innovations, uh, that, uh, really helps me to kind of lay out. Uh, that's one of the things that poser has an advantage of over dad studio is being able to use that animation to create panel by panel. And then, when I go to my movie settings and I just do a batch render, I can go to sleep and it'll render all my images while I sleep. So I can keep my computer working even when I'm not. So it's kind of cool. Cool. All right. Well, thank you so much for showing us your process, Alan. Thank you for having me. Yeah. And everybody check out your Kickstarter. Uh, it's called Red Cat. I will put the, the link in the show notes. Excellent. Thank you so much, Alan. Have a great day rest of your day you too take care and thank you everybody for watching the video bye-bye we'll catch you next week <laughs>